Good morning and welcome to the first jump webinar of 2024. My, doesn't time fly? And what can only be described as a cold and wintry day. And we're going to talk about a topic which is often classed as a very cold and wintry topic business development strategies, especially for your new and existing clients. And as 2023 closed, the new year opens, the chatter in the marketplace has been very mixed. Some people are saying they start the new year with lots of requirement flow, while other appears to be lacking in requirements. However, it's not all doom and gloom. The new norm has yet to really truly establish itself. So what Christmas period actually looks like in the new norm, no one really knows. So comparing yourself to last year and the year before is probably a little bit folly. OK, but here in the UK and America, we're waiting for your elections to be announced, which will give business a bit of stability for the next four or five years and once those are announced hopefully we start to see a shift in the marketplace the marketplace starts to move forward but before that we've got to start building our business development strategies and developing our existing and new clients so here's some stats on clients and what happens the probability of selling to your existing clients is 60 to 70 percent chance well probability of selling to new prospects is only a five to 20 percent chance increasing your customer retention by five percent increases your profit by between 25 and 95 percent 44% of companies have a greater focus on acquisition versus 16% on retention, which says quite a lot. 65% of businesses come from existing customers. So that 16% on retention is a real question mark. Okay. From For most industries, the average customer retention rate is below 20%. Loyal customers spend 67% more than new ones. And only 40% of companies and 30% of agencies have an equal focus on acquisition and retention. And 98% of customers see the experience as a key factor in driving customer loyalty. When asked in a survey about customer loyalty, 74% of respondents said it's about feeling appreciated and understood rather than receiving special offers. And 64% also mentioned that they are willing to spend more with a brand that they remember and made a personalized gesture or offering to them. 96% of buyers mentioned customer service as the primary factor behind customer loyalty. And finally, according to Forbes, 74% of respondents made purchases based on their buying experience and 77% 77% view customer experience as the most important product based around quality and capability. This week, I'm joined by Dave. Dave, Happy New Year. Welcome back. I hope you've had a really good one. Uh, Paul and Heather are out with clients this morning on two emergency client meetings, which is quite interesting. Um, so to everybody, OK, Happy New Year. And here's the first question for the year. And the question is this. Dave, how do you recommend fostering a culture of proactive business development within a recruitment team, ensuring that it becomes a habitual practice rather than the sporadic efforts that we see in today's marketplaces? Morning, Howard. Morning, everybody. Happy New Year. I, I've missed your stats, Howard. Good. Over the Christmas period, on Christmas morning, we all got up and 45% of my 90% of kids enjoyed 38% of their meal. <laughs> and 100% uh, hate them. We yeah. haven't got any stats for our Christmas period. I miss them. You should have rung me up, Dave. I could have told you 100% of kids hate sprouts. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely right. I'll tell you what's interesting about that, that question, Howard, is that you said... Um, how do you recommend in, how do you recommend a, a culture of fostering a culture of uh, business development? And I think that word foster is really important because when you think of fostering, if you think of it out of a business setting and you think of it in a humane family setting, if you've ever had the privilege of fostering a child, what, what that brings with you are words like care, looking after them. Um, it brings focus, but it also brings challenge and difficulty. And it can be quite uh, mercurial how the behaviour is. Everything seems a little bit more unusual, whereas to your stats earlier, if you're looking after, you're retaining, you're looking after something that you know is 
fairly solid, it's repetitive, it's much, much easier. So I, I think to answer your question, and we look at 2024, we need to have that culture of fostering. We need to be able to say, actually, business development is really vital for our organisations and for all the people in our organisations. And I mean all the people. We often just think of the, the sales consultants going after new business, but everybody can be aware of what's going on in the market, can be aware of the news, can be aware of technology changes, healthcare changes, education changes, whatever sector you're in. And if your culture is, if you hear that something's going on, let us know, then I think that culture of fostering business development, it just becomes part of the course. It just becomes something that everybody does. So I would encourage us all to think about 2024 as the year of business development. And that's the development of your business, which includes bringing on new customers as well as looking after existing ones. And I would think of it in that terms of fostering, looking after them, nurturing them, caring for that as a, as a, a speciality, as a methodology. I think it's an interesting comment. And when I sort of wrote the question, it was a sort of question that sort of I started to think about my background, start to think, you know, sort of what I've done in the past and, you know, where success came from. And success came from stopping that boom and bust that happens in recruitment all along. And that's that sporadic effort that people get. They get lots of jobs on and then stop. And so to me, then it was about creating that habitual practice of creating the habit daily rather than just talking about the habit daily. We yeah. make far too many excuses, I think, in recruitment. And that's interesting. In fostering, we make too many excuses about why we should do those type of things and why we should care about certain things. And I think we make too many excuses. I've got a new job on. I've got a job that I need to fill. I've got to find this candidate. I've got to do this. When actually, we should be thinking about the knock-on effect of creating that daily habit. And that knock-on effect would be, if we started to create a daily habit of new business, then we'd have more opportunity to choose from and therefore we could start to reduce the amount of time we spend on clients that aren't really worth spending time on and so it's about creating the habits that consultants need to create the habits but we've also got to think about the habits of our clients and our candidates because those habits have also changed and those habits have changed to become more emotionally attached to a brand and a service and therefore, what are we doing to get our brand out there? So new business development isn't just about picking up the phone and calling a client. It's also about your brand recognition and using your brand. And that brand is not about your logo. The brand is about your service. And it's about the service and the way you make people feel. And it's the way that people then think about buying a product or buying a service it's that emotional attachment and the desire to buy because they feel they're going to get a good service and that's the same thing about your staff when you're talking about business development we've got to make sure that we are doing the right things to create that habitual habit and not just smashing them on the head if they're failing because we know that business development between five and twenty percent chance of opening a new client it takes a long time to get momentum and yeah. keep momentum. And yet when we measure by KPIs on a daily basis, we're forever knocking people for that. So I think to foster a culture of positivity and long term development is far more advantageous for a recruitment agency than just traditional off you go and see what happens and creating that boom and bust situation from there. So as we talk about that, can you sort of share specific success success stories or case studies where you've effectively deepened relationships with existing clients and what strategies contributed to that success? Well, I can think of a number of examples, but I'll give you just one that if you're watching this webinar, you can do this very, very simply. If you've got a marketing person or team, you can they can help you. And if you haven't, you can just do it quite simple. And it was to begin the year, we began the year, and we asked all of our consultants who had relationships with people rather than numbers. So it wasn't an RPO type approach. It was where you know an individual quite well on your client side. And we got them to ask one question. Um, I think it was 2007. 
2007. Um, but it still applies today. And the question was, um, what one thing are we not doing for you that you would like us to do? And it was that simple. Um, it had the words, you know, something like, thank you for your business. We appreciate what you're doing. Thank you for your support in 2023, or as it was 2006. Um, as we look at 2007, what one thing are we not doing for you that you would like us to do? And what we found was um, some people didn't respond at all. There was, there was no uh, there was no respond. But some people really engaged with, the, with the, that question. And all sorts of different things came back. You know, I'd like you to, I'd like to see these two be a bit faster. Um, I'd like more CVs, the usual stuff. I'd like to fill more jobs. You know, you got that sort of stuff. But you also got some questions about workforce. I think we're going to be doing this this year. Can you help me? What are some of the trends in the marketplace? Some of your competitors give me monthly data. You don't seem to do that. So we got to find out what some of our competitors were doing. They, they weren't named in most cases. Um, and it led to a much more intelligent one-to-one -one conversation between the manager and the director and the consultant to say, okay, what are we going to do? How are we going to respond to that? And it absolutely helped with the retention of the customer. Because if they were also thinking of leaving us and they were bothered to tell us, they would have told us then. And most of them didn't. So I think that's a question that you can start mid January by going to your existing customers via your consultants, as long as they've got a relationship so that the client will either pick up the phone or answer the question and say, what one thing are we not doing for you that you'd like us to do? Because it's not loads of questions, Howard, they tend to engage with it. It's interesting because when I, again, when I sort of sat down and started to think about the questions we should be asking for this, I based this on a answer and I don't normally do that. I normally write the question, then get the answer. But I thought I've got an yeah. answer that I need to write a question <laughs> about. And that's what I put forward. And it's almost a similar story. It was about one of my biggest clients uh, that I was working with. And over this year, we then doubled the size of that client and, and what we were working with that client on. And it was going back to them with a question. And it was the question. And we were contract. We were supplying con IT contractors into them. And the question was very simple. How do we make you more attractive to your candidate pool that isn't working for you? Yeah, yeah, great question. And they came back with all sorts of different ideas of what they wanted to push forward, how they could push things forward, etc. And what that created was an opportunity for us to go back to them with different ideas, which helped them, A, retain more of the contractors that were already working on the projects for them because that was vitally important, but they, B, then attract more candidates to them. And it was all about the service levels that we could offer and the service levels that the client could offer to the candidate as well. And so we worked really hard about building a deeper relationship with that client and how that client worked. And that was one of the questions, that was the first sort of questions that really kicked off that, that process. And what we found was that it highlighted for us weaknesses in our process of attracting and retaining candidates, but it also highlighted in their process weakness and you know, strengths in attracting candidates and those sort of things and help to build. And this was a client that was probably paying about 15 to 20 percent less than the market average, right. but had volume work. And right. it was a great opportunity to work with clients. So we got people on there that were, ended up, and this is the, the older days, obviously, in recruitment in the, in the 90s, where people were time bound on IR35, et cetera. We had people who had been working there 10, 15 years after you know, a period. So when I first started, I opened the client up, when I left 10 years later, there were still clients that, candidates that were there, and they carried on working there for an awful long time until the IR35 came in. But to me, it was about that process. The other thing that I thought about was a case to do with a client that we went to talk to and it was all about showing the client our knowledge of them and their marketplace and it was interesting as we we'd sort of signed this deal as the, as we walked out the client asked us which office was going to be deal, be deal with and I said it's just I have an office in Leeds and that's it and he was like oh right I thought you were a global company by the way that you'd marketed <laughs> yourselves and so he said, so I'm going to sit you down and ask you what you actually know about our marketplace. So I sat down, I thought of opened up my laptop. And at that time, we were using um, 
Bullhorn and you could have a heat map on Bullhorn of your geographical marketplace that you're working with. And so I opened up this heat map and said, all these crosses on this map are all your competing clients for staff. And he went, okay. He said, and all the X's are all your candidates. I then put, here are all the blue dots. They're the candidates that are working for you. Here are all the red dots that aren't. And he said, oh my God, I can't believe you know so many candidates, so many clients. And he suddenly he, he suddenly realized that we knew everything about his marketplace and what his yeah. marketplace was doing. Yeah. And we started to talk about who was going here, who was, who was going there. So I think to deepen relationships that you have to really understand your client. And I think you yeah. have to understand your client's marketplace for candidate attraction and retention, not just what's happening in that marketplace. So to me, they were sort of they're sort of three things that you could really start to very quickly implement to your business development strategy to help you to move forward. So we know that it's a really competitive landscape and it's always going to be competitive in recruitment, especially in the UK. What innovative approaches do you suggest for identifying and attracting new clients? Well, I, I was thinking about this, Ed. I'm not sure it's necessarily an innovative approach because it's something I think we should be doing, but we don't do it religiously. We don't do it, to use your word in the first question, habitually. Yeah, we did a, a campaign once. Remember Wally? It was a Where's Wally campaign. And what we did, we looked back at every single candidate we had put forward, per man contract, via each office um, the previous year. And we wanted to know where they were, where they are now. And that unearthed across the, the, the country, across different offices, a significant number of opportunities that I'm not sure that we would have picked up had we not had that spotlight focus on each candidate. It took a bit of work, but data is, is ubiquitous. And with the systems that we all have now, it's so much easier to pinpoint. But for example, if you've got consultants at the desk who are working on requirements of today, which are obviously really important, what about looking back at last year? The, the person that finished second for a role or a role that you didn't fill. Where are all those people? And it takes a bit of time, but that's okay. We, we've got time. We can do it on the train on the way in or the way out. We can use our laptop, our phone. It isn't a difficult thing to do. But with LinkedIn and with the tools that we have and our CRM and all the other tools that go along with it, like Sourcebreaker and other things that you may or may not have access to, if you can find out where they are now, some of them will have joined a company and left after six months before the before any of the periods ended. Or, or you, you'd be amazed at what you find if you have a spotlight focus on where the candidates are, including new companies that you didn't know existed, maybe startup companies, new schools, new healthcare authorities, whatever it may be, whatever sector you're in. Do you know where every single candidate that you didn't place but you put forward last year? Because if you put them forward, they must be an okay candidate. Otherwise, you wouldn't have put them forward. So you know the candidates, man. Where are they now? We, we call it Where's Wally. You can call it whatever you like. But I think you'd be amazed if you do that over a period of time, over a few weeks, you will find out more about uh, what's going on in your area, in your market, in your sector, whatever it may be. Um, as I said, Howard, it's not particularly innovative, but it's sometimes good to get back to basics. It's not innovative, and it's, it's something that I certainly made a note of that when I wrote the question, that's one of the things that I was going to sort of push out there because what it, you're doing is you're finding like clients, and the yeah. more clients that mirror each other, the easier it is to recycle your candidate database, and therefore the cost effective of can or you become more cost effective at candidate acquisition as well as client acquisition, and obviously therefore your data is more relevant to each individual client than before. And so to me, it was a, a very simple simple thing when I was sort of managing teams from this. It was to create active lists of potential clients, and having a look at what's short term what's medium term and what's long term and separating those clients into different lists and as i said if you're looking at your clients that you've interviewed over the last 12 months it does exactly that but when you start to look at your medium and long-term clients you start to think about some clients might take a year 12 months 18 months 24 months to break into where some clients might be short term and those have different approaches 
of what's happening. So having a lens on your current clients and elapsed clients is critical. But the biggest issue with BD is mindset. And I think the biggest thing is once you change the mindset of the consultant and you actually understood that there are certain clients that you want to break in really quickly because they could be broken into quickly, some yeah. that were med- going to take a medium term and some that are long term, it means that you could start to refresh their mindset about it's not just a boring job. We know that this is going to take a long term to break into. We know this should be fairly simple to break into. And therefore, what we did was constantly refresh those lists. And therefore, we've had clients coming off those lists and clients coming into those lists constantly. And therefore, the consultant never got that, I suppose, horrible gut feeling of when you walked walk in the morning and says, oh, BD, I've got to do a load of BD today. And you look down those lists and there's loads of clients that you've called and called and called, but they've never answered. They've never said yes. So the question is, why are you still calling them? So it was constantly calling those clients that never answered the phone or never picked up the phone to you or never answered an email or whatever it be. And therefore, your list was positive clients that had potential, whether it be short, medium or long term, of how you're going to open it. And then it was about setting at the time was called setting KPIs. It was about setting actions that you wanted from those clients, so that whether it was a meeting, it wasn't about driving requirements. It was about driving data and driving information and then driving a meeting to further your relationship with the client. So I always think that it's hard enough getting clients into that sales funnel. It's even harder to get them out of the bottom of the sales funnel where they turn to gold for you. And so it's about tracking our consultants, tracking their approach to the clients, appraising them as they get further and further through the approach, finding ways to get through that approach, because we're not creating instant cash in brand new clients. It's really hard to create instant cash out of brand new clients. To me, it's the ongoing process. But we measure our consultants by the month, what you're going to build this month, what you're going to build this month, what you're going to build this month. And therefore they don't really focus then on the long-term approach of client development. And that's when we should start to change the mindset and build that. So I think to change the landscape, it's competitive, is change your mindset of your consultants because the old tried and methods still work and probably work better than a lot of the new methods. Add some new technology to it, great. But to me, it's the mindset of the consultant. If we looked at that then, Dave, business development can come with its fair share of challenges. So what's the common obstacles do you observe in expanding a client base and how do you recommend overcoming them for sustained growth? Um, it's interesting. I think you may have answered this question by your last answer, Howard, because <laughs> I think one of the biggest challenges is management, is our management and our leadership. Because two of the things you need for business development is tenacity, to hang in there, to map the right things, to keep going, to keep looking, not to give in, keep going when you, you things are tough, and courage. And the courage bit is to have the ammunition, to have the proof, to have the data that what you're doing is the right thing and it will eventually work out for good. So the challenge is often managing the manager. Because the manager's thinking perhaps a little bit like what you've just said, Howard. Right, what are you doing today? What are you doing today? Where are your CV today? Things that we know when running our recruitment businesses are really important. But if 5% of your business is uh, is new business, yeah, well, you, you want to raise that to 10% or 15%. You need to know that you're in it for the longer game. And it can take a while. And as long as your consultants are doing the right thing over time, then I think if you have the courage and the tenacity to hang in with them, to guide them, to make sure that when you're doing your one-to-ones, you spend a disproportionate amount of time on business development versus existing clients, you'll begin to foster, that word again, uh, the culture that actually we need this. And if you've got people who work for you who are just account managers and they are wonderful people account managers but they're not targeted or rewarded on new business they still can get new business from existing clients as we've already spoken about so are you spending time 
asking them about those sort of questions and are you hanging in with them and not expecting an answer to some of the questions by the end of the day, the end of the week, the end of the month, when actually it may take a bit longer. So it's the, ch the challenges to overcome are the managers who are maybe driven, motivated and rewarded on money today, income today. Um, if, you're in a, if you're in a situation where you know you've got to find five forklift truck drivers for someone tomorrow, you know, thinking two months ahead is a bit more challenging. But you do need to have an aspect of what they're doing that has a future look. So I think that that's how you overcome that with tenacity and courage. So it's interesting, isn't it? That the challenge is, for me, is to create that consistency of doing new business. Yeah. It, yeah. It's not the consistency of opening new clients. It's the consistency of doing yeah. the actions that open new business. And therefore, I think a lot of companies train their staff reasonably well on new business and how to open new business. But what they don't do is create the methodology that's methodical and consistent that then creates consistent results they just let the staff go and once you've got a job all right now fill the job fill the job fill the job then you might spend two weeks trying to fill the job but then you haven't done any business development so i think it's consistency that creates methodical process okay and that methodical process creates consistent results so we've got to think about it the other the two ways i also think about it the other way around sometimes it's interesting sometimes when you, I'm, I was talking to consultants about what they're doing, I don't talk about what their challenges are. Talk about what the client's challenges and what the candidate's challenges are. And we think about distressed purchases. We think about the candidate journey. Well, most purchases by a client aren't distressed purchases. If the average attrition rate in the UK is 20%, then only 20% is somebody's left. I need to find somebody to replace that person straight away. So what's the other 80%? That other 80% is planned business. And therefore, when we go and talk to clients, what we tend to talk to clients about is our recruitment process. We tend to talk about when do you next have a job? We don't tend to talk about what's your planning over the next 12, 18 months. And so it's changing the questions because that's what the client's challenges are. And once we understand the client's challenge, then we can go back and look at our candidate challenge. How do we get candidates to be attracted to that company, to that job, et cetera, before that job's come out? So I think new business development is a real interesting view. And I think the challenges are get the methodical process right and get the right process in so it becomes consistent. Then think about the challenges from the client's point of view and the candidate's point of view and then start to develop strategies for that so you can question your clients so then you can start to create a candidate pool. Because we all think about it. You know, client comes to us, we all say, of course we use the passive marketplace. No, client comes to us, we spend a fortune on advertising, spend a fortune on LinkedIn, spend a fortune on all these processes to drag candidates from the job boards, et cetera, et cetera. But if we'd have moaned three, six, 12 months ago about those jobs coming through, we'd have been subliminally marketing to the candidates on our database, marketing to candidates if we haven't got those to get them onto our database. So when the jobs come, we've already pre-lined them. We've already been talking to them. We've already started to engage them. And that goes back to our question one. You know, what we were doing in question one, it's all about that consistency and creating the habits of driving the right thing so to me i think i'd look at it in those two ways about the challenges of methodical process of new business and then understand the client's challenges and the candidate's challenges so you can shape your processes around them rather than shape them around recruitment which is only a certain period of time when they've got all of those processes already done and done so with evolving landscape of recruitment and business development, how do you stay abreast of industry trends and how should recruitment leaders adapt their strategies to align with these trends? Well, one thing that we are not short of in today's economy, uh, it is after all called the attention economy, is people shouting at us online or elsewhere to tell us what's going on and what we need to be aware of. And if you're a recruitment leader and you are not aware of industry trends, then you're not doing your job properly. That's a bit harsh, maybe, H, but the, the point is there's no excuse for not knowing what's going on. Um, 
and I'll plug us, Howard. We've got data on our website that you can look at. We, you can get information from the REC, you can get information from teams, you can get information from a whole variety of recruitment type sources that is absolutely relevant to your market. Um, I deal with uh, work alongside a healthcare company. Um, we get a, a monthly report from uh, one of the big four um, consulting firms about trends in healthcare. We uh, get a weekly, uh, in fact, in one case, a daily subscription from things like the King's Fund, the Nuffield Trust, the three big, two of the three big um, um, organisations. And whilst there's so much information, it's ubiquitous that sometimes it's difficult to find the nuggets that's relevant. As a leader, that's your job. And you should be spending 20% of your week on the future, on what is going on, on what are the trends, where do you need to be? And then you take that, you desell it, and then you pass it on to your consultants. And the really good consultants and the really good future leaders are the ones that come to you and say, hey, Gaffer, have you heard this is going on? Have you seen that this is happening in this area or in this geography? Or I, I read a book about this or I saw this online. So it's just about getting, signing up to the right places to get the information. And then as is always the case with information and data, it's what you decide to do with it that's relevant for your business. But there's absolutely no excuse for not knowing what's going on. Absolutely not at all. So think of everything that we've talked about. If you're going back to your existing candidates that you've worked with and asking what's happening with them, if you are then going to your clients and trying to really understand what their manning levels, staffing levels, et cetera, are for the next 12, 18 months, then you have an understanding of what data you require to match your clients and your candidates' needs. And therefore, you can start to have those intelligent conversations about you know, what's actually happening in the marketplace. And I think that's the bit where... Yeah, you know, I say this a lot, and I've said it on this these webinars an awful lot. That clients, we treat every client as a prospect, and they treat as every most recruitment agents as suspect. And I think if you start to go to clients with data from the Office of National Statistics, from the REC, from loads of places where you can pull data from, I pull data every week for for us for for the webinars. It's yeah. very easy to find good yeah. solid data forms, and once you bring those data forms to them and say, this has come from the Harvard Business Review. This has come from this. This has come from this. You're actually upping your data value because it's been listed of where the Office of National Statistics are saying this. I mean, I've, I have, I've got clients of going out and talking to their clients and saying, your recruitment process is slow. And they're saying, well, what do you mean? Well, the Office of National Statistics says it was last week, it was last year, it was seven point to it's dropped to 6.8 weeks for the average recruitment process for a permanent recruit however candidates are on the market less than four weeks so there's a massive problem with your recruitment process compared to what the candidate markets now that will change constantly but the ons update that every single quarter and that's the bit where you keep on top of your data and obviously data then that's coming in with from your candidates and from your clients you can start to harvest and do that so it's all about the service and again we've talked about this in the before you know recruitment is a shop but our shop has no product in it until our candidates clients say this is the product that i want you to fill our shops with but if we knew what the clients wanted prior to that we could have already filled our shop and therefore it's about the service when our clients come in and the services that's not going to be on the, the shelf very long that's going to disappear very long you need to buy that because the price is going up really really quickly and that's exactly what we do with food look at the problem with that we have with food as soon as someone said there's a food shortage everyone goes out and buys food someone says christmas is coming everyone else goes out and buys food because they can see there's going to be a problem so it's all about that data drives the service of what's going on and then it's about the supply and demand of that product once they get into your product into your shop so i think we've got to start to think about stop using candidates as a throwaway product start treating them as a long-term product start thinking about our clients long-term rather than short-term and that means that we stay abreast of the trends we can then inform our clients logically about what's happening and that creates a better relationship because you become a trusted partner rather than just a partner. 
Can I add to that, Howard? I know we're running out of time, but um, I attended a dinner from Talent last um, last year, to, towards the end of last year, and they told us as recruitment leaders that the average time to hire in 21-22 for that 12 months was 42 days for permanent staff, but the average time to hire for last year was 43 days. So I told my clients this piece, of, gave this, this, this piece of data, and two of them, used it when they were taking requirements from clients to say average time to hire seems to be 43 days do you think you can if we find you the right candidate can you get this over the line quicker than the average because if you can we really want to work hard on it because we know that if you can't you're going to lose good candidates and what it led to was just a really intelligent conversation but uh, they were able to secure better business and were able to move the clients a little bit faster just with that bit, that one piece of data that was available for them to to use so um, absolutely use the data and uh, and make it work for your business so how can technology then be effectively sort of leveraged to enhance business development efforts in the recruitment industry and are there specific tools or platforms that you find valuable in this regard yeah, I think um, one thing we can all do in 2024 is make sure that we know how to get the best of the technology we have before we go and invest in a shiny new thing. Uh, as recruitment leaders, that we are bombarded, aren't we, with new technology that will change the world, that is a panacea for all the problems of our business. But, you know, often the answers to some of the questions that we have about how can I do this, where can I get this, how do I get access to this, is within the technology that we have. We just don't know it or we haven't been reminded of it or we haven't had an update. So my first part of the answer to that question, Ad, is try to make sure that as leaders um, responding to people at the desk, that you know you're getting the best out of what you've got. The other thing to say is that there are tools. I, I particularly um, like the Source Breaker tool that, that Steve and his team built and then sold on to um, to Bullhorn last year. I think that's a great tool for, for to use for business development because you, you use the word heat map. How you can find out where candidates are, where clients are. You can get news feeds. Other tools are available, um, but you know, from the from the technology point of view, there, there's plenty out there. But before you invest in something new. Just make sure that the stuff that you've got is working to the maximum capacity for you. And if it isn't and you need something, you go out and have a look. It's interesting, isn't it? I've been talking quite heavily with a number of CRM providers over the last sort of month or so, as some of the clients are you know, looking to change their CRM provider. Some are looking to become partners with ourselves, et cetera. And it was interesting, virtually all of them came out with a stat, which I think is damning on them. Yeah. and also damning on the recruitment industry that most crms the functionality is only utilized about 20 percent of the time and that to me is a real damning stat that if we're only using 20 percent of the functionality that we have already what's the point of buying new systems to get an extra 20 percent that you know isn't going to really help grow so i think you're right in your comment that we need to get better understanding of our current technology and whether it can use that and it was interesting asking my clients certain questions they didn't know the answer whether their crm could do that when they went back to their existing crm provider they went yes you just need to do this this and this and they just didn't have a clue about that and they were going to spend a fortune on a new system that was already implemented in their system so i think there are specific tools out there that you want to buy as an add-on which absolutely would be advantageous to you but what you've got to do is understand what your crm provider is actually can do for you and i think if we trained harder and i think we do this all the time we, we train easy in recruitment to recruit hard if we trained hard it make recruitment easy and some of that recruitment is training hard on our crm and on our technology so our last question dave okay and this is always a contentious one okay um, metric um... metrics play a crucial role in assessing the success of business development efforts what kpis do you recommend monitoring and how can recruitment leaders ensure they are effectively measuring 
and improving their business development outcomes? Oh, gosh. Um, well, I mean, a couple that I think are, are really important in a very talent-fluid market. Most most of our sectors are struggling for good talent, uh, good people. So if you're getting requirements and opportunities to fill, um, KPIs like time to hire and time to respond from the client's point of view to the point I was mentioning earlier are really important. If I'm going to work on this and use my skills, um, and remember, we are equal to our clients. We are there to serve them, but we are equal to them. You know, sometimes at the desk, our consultants see themselves as beneath the client. The client is really important, which they are, and they've got really big jobs, which they have, but so have we. We're the brokers. We know where the talent is. Our, our role is of equivalent status of the clients that we serve. And if we see ourselves in that light, and then they can't answer questions about things which are going to waste our time, like, can I book an in, can I, if I get the requirement now, can I book some time in your diary for next week or whenever um, to, to set up interviews? They won't give you the same credibility and same sense of authority of then do you really want to work with them? Now, the answer may be, yes, I need to because I need some new business. But the, the question is, see yourself as equal to your clients and make sure you understand their time to respond and their time to hire, what that is. And if they don't know and you've got data to help them, you use that data. Um, you know, I, I think that's just, uh, I mean, that may be rather mundane, but I think if we're going to work on quality stuff in 2024 and our clients are going to understand that our time is as valuable as theirs, then we've got to make sure that they understand that those sort of things are, are measuring. The, the other one is, from a business development point of view, is how many people have you spoken to? Because it's so difficult to get people on the phone these days. Everything is done on, on WhatsApp or by text or, or by networking groups and things like that. And that's OK. That, that, that's, that's the way of the world now. It's, it's changed. It isn't just about hammering the phones. Um, but how many people have you spoken to and what sort of quality of conversations? And you can only have that in a one-to-one. -one. Um, just, just filling out a chart or filling out something on, online. Uh, I've spoken to eight people today. Well, I'd rather you spoke to, I'd rather you have one solid conversation than seven flippant ones. So it's the quality of the conversation rather than the number. So I think, I don't disagree with any of that. I think we should start to think about removing KPIs to a certain degree and start implementing trends but then to me it's about breaking the process down into more in-depth processes so your pre-engagement process your sales engagement process your meeting process your sales pitch process your recruitment process your you know ongoing business development process etc cetera, etc cetera, and have different measurements in all of those because what you're talking about dave there is measuring this type of thing but if you're yeah. measuring the number of calls that you've made or the number of people that you've spoken to okay i could have a day where i've sp spoken to or dialed 50 times and no one's picked up the phone yeah, yeah you know that's a bad day but i've dialed 50 people tomorrow i might dial two people and spend four hours on the phone to those two people because of what they need etc cetera, etc cetera. so to me it should be spread over a certain period of time and say every two weeks measure your trends of what's happening in those two weeks time so what's your pre-engagement trend look like what's your sales engagement how many meetings you've had over two weeks how many times have you pitched clients over two weeks how many times have you engaged in the recruitment process in two weeks etc cetera, etc cetera. all of these things become then a slightly different viewpoint and then you can start to see where your business is slowing down. So if you look at over two weeks and you suddenly realize I've been doing loads of recruitment process and I've been loads of business development with my ongoing clients, but I've had no pre-engagement. I've had no sales engagements. And I've had no meetings with new clients. You can see that flux in the trend and therefore you need to see where you can then start to push back into what business you need to be doing because it's very easy to get swamped with business development of your existing client base when you need to be doing business development with new clients to change or increase your capability of filling and growing your business and scaling your business when your development of your existing client base might be looking it's going up but actually after a while it starts to drop and you've got nothing to fill that drop at all and so it's about breaking it down i think into different segments and then start to measure what you're doing in each segment to actually ensure you have consistency 
And that to me is the sort of easiest point that you can start to think about your sales journey is think about how your clients go through that sales journey. And that sales journey isn't when they give you a job. That sales journey is when you start to engage with them to start to work with them and then think about your candidate journey. OK, and how you get your candidate through that journey. And that's pre-engagement, sales engagement, meeting, pitch, recruitment process, development process, etc. There's loads and loads of sort of different sort of sections I could sort of throw in there that enables you to measure your productivity of performance, not productivity of cash, because that will only come right at the end when they've got all the way through that process. But you start to lose productivity in certain of those areas and it reduces the cash at the end. Dave, as always, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the first session of the year. Next week, we've got a really interesting session. We're going to talk about how to increase your prices to your clients, okay, without the clients batting an eyelid. So we're going to start to really address some of the things that are key in the market at the moment and it isn't about reducing fees it's about increasing fees so how can we do that without your clients batting an eyelid ladies and gents thanks very much look forward to seeing you all next week happy new year once again dave thank you very much and we look forward to seeing you again next week cheers have a good week everybody see you next week